if any of you are in, you know young people interested in learning about behavior, uh, I think the future, the future is just beginning uh, where we're going to go with the study of the biology behavior. It's an exciting, really exciting area to be in. Biology behavior, though, is not studied by, or has not been studied by traditional uh, psychology. Not much at all. Uh, and certainly not by sociology or cultural anthropology. When I was taking classes, and I was a biology major in Michigan, I was interested in behavior, but there were no courses in the biology behavior at all. Uh, I took 30-some uh, hours of soch and psych and so on, but it was the dark ages uh, for behavior education. Everything, I think many of you were trained the same way, everything was environmental. Ever since the 1940s with Watson and Skinner and the social science uh, uh, model that developed afterwards, virtually all students in every university were basically, their behavior education was basically social science. And the social science pretty much ignored all biology. There were no genetic explanations, virtually no proximate mechanisms, no evolutionary explanations. Um, behavior was thought to be something, it's as though we dropped out of the sky, that we were not animals, that we were not connected evolutionarily with, uh, with the, uh, any kind of a history of, of animal life. So that's, part, that's kind of why I developed the course in Henry Ford. I was, the students were just so impoverished. Uh, their behavior education was getting none of the biology. You cannot understand very much about human behavior if you leave out all the biology, but if you want to understand a little bit more about uh, the environmental determinism that suggested that virtually all behavior is a result of experience, learning, acculturation, and has little or nothing to do with biology, I would recommend Steven Pinker. Uh, Steven Pinker's The Blank Slate is an excellent book, one of, one of the best books I've read for several years, uh, discussing the whole uh, tradition of social science education and why biology was ignored for so long. The three main approaches to the study of uh, the biology behavior are, first of all, the genetic basis. Um, that's complicated. I can't say too much about it. There's, uh, behavior genetics is a really interesting field. And I've met and talked with and heard presentations from many, many behavior geneticists at the conferences. And I'm really intrigued with what they're doing. Uh, a, a, few, a few general principles about behavior genetics. All genes are environmentally dependent. It's never nature versus nurture. Every gene is dependent for its, for its expression, dependent upon the particular behavior, uh, environmental context. So the old nature-nurture dichotomy does not make any sense. Um, you could also, I think, pretty safely say that pretty much all behaviors have some biological input. Some, that the biology plays some role in virtually all behaviors, even ones that you, where you'd, I'll, I'll illustrate in a minute, even ones you'd never suspect. Some uh, genes influenced by behaviors are pretty easily modified. Some behaviors are pretty easily modified. For example, shyness is pretty strongly influenced by genes, but shyness can, with the right experience, be overcome uh, to quite a large degree. On the other hand, there are some behaviors that where environmental influence doesn't seem to have much effect, like psychopathy, sociopathy. Sociopaths, psychopaths, uh, there's been little hope to be able to change psychopaths or sociopaths' behaviors. It seems to be very resistant to any kind of interference or environmental help. Some genes, of course, are dominant. Uh, some are recessive. You need two copies for the gene to be expressed. Uh, some are sex-linked, which means they occur on the X chromosome. And if they are recessive, that, that trait will show up like 10 times more often in males than in females. Some genes are sex-linked, uh, uh, sex-limited rather, which means they're only expressed in male or female bodies, like the genitalia, for example. Um, I remember once 
most people don't know this, I don't think, but I remember once mentioning in a biology class that sex-limited genes influenced, oh, like in a, a woman could get uh, genes from her father that influenced the shape of her breast. That's true. A man could get genes from his mother that influenced the size of his penis. When I said that, one smart ass guy in the class said, thank you, mother. <laughs> the guys look disgusted at him. <laughs> most behaviors are caused by multiple genes. It's complicated. There are a lot of genes that influence most traits. Most genes, on the other hand, are pleiotropic. They influence more than one trait. So there's a lot to straighten out here. Um, even uh, behaviors that we think of as strictly cultural are, on a, as E.O. Wilson has said, are on a genetic leash. Take genuflection, for example. Genuflection, the Catholic process of, of going down on one knee, showing appeasement, deference to the Creator. Genuflection is certainly a, cre a, a cultural creation, but you can't explain genuflection without understanding that we are naturally inclined to lower our heads and bodies when we feel deference and appeasement. We do it all the time when we're confronting. The same way when a dog uh, slinks out of the room after he's gotten into the, the liver pate on the coffee table. Uh, we, the same, we, we show body lowering appeasement in hundreds of cultural different ways. Culture is on a genetic leash. Genuflection can't be understood nor can bowing or curtsying or any of these other forms of body lowering appeasement be understood without understanding some biology. Uh, there's a lot of variation. Um, all biological traits, sometimes people show much more strongly, other people show much more weakly. Um, so you have to take that into consideration too. Um, even consider something like violence in humans. You have to take uh, biology into consideration to explain violence. Men murder 40 times more often than women do. I think we should take into consideration it has something to do with the male gender. Uh, virtually all mass murderers are men. Always men. They are almost always young men. This is biology. This is testosterone in some, uh, to, to some degree. The, as I mentioned, sociopaths or psychopaths uh, are very, very it's, conditions very resistant to change, to, to make, um, they tend to be genetically uh, inclined to be vindictive, to lack shame, to be impulsive, uh, to show no remorse, uh, to be deliberately annoying and oppositional in their behavior. And the, these traits seem to be, to a large degree, heritable, not learned. Speaking of heritable, heritability doesn't mean the same thing as whether something is inherited. Heritability is um, uh, something behavior geneticists use to, uh, uh, to describe the extent to which uh, variation in the population is due to genes versus uh, some environmental influence. Um, if the heritability figure is one, that means it's completely due to genes. That, it's extremely rare, almost nothing is, uh, uh, is at one. If the heritability figure is zero, it means genes don't play any role at all. You know, like I suppose whether you wear, happen to wear a, a bow tie instead of a regular tie. Uh, perhaps no genetic influence there. Um, here are some heritability figures. Oh, by the way, I think most of you know, of, you may not know Bouchard at University of Minnesota. Have you heard of the Minnesota Twin Study? Uh, Thomas Bouchard at University of Minnesota, for I think it's been about 30 years now, has done the biggest, best uh, behavior genetic study of human traits I think any ever been done. Many other universities, many other scientists have done behavior genetic studies that have confirmed much of what uh, Bouchard has shown. Here's, uh, here's some here, typical heritability figures. Height, a person's height in the United States is about, it shows a nine, that means about nine tenths of the variability in people's height can be explained by what genes you inherited. 
Uh, why do I say in the U.S.? Because it make every heritability figure it depends on what your population is. If we were to look at the heritability for of uh, height in say Togo, it would be much lower. Uh, if because the environmental conditions where children received insufficient food or have uh, much, uh, their growth is more often get, get stunted because of uh, childhood diseases and so on, the heritability figure would be much lower. So you have to consider what population you're looking at when you, when you do calculations of heritability. Um, all these, is next, being extroverted, being shy, being impulsive, being even your aesthetic preferences, who would have thought? Uh, your social, I, I was startled when I first learned this. Social and political attitudes have a strong genetic component. Ex especially conservatism, extreme conservatism. It seems as though to a large extent Republicans are born. Um, and sexual orientation. These studies are done, you know, this isn't some, somebody just made up these figures. Uh, Bouchard's research and, and the other people who have been doing similar studies are good scientists and they have used methods like studying siblings raised together, siblings raised apart. Identical twins raised together. Bouchard had 50 pairs of identical twins that he studied that were raised apart. Boy, that tells you a lot about environment and genes and what, you know, what's important in that case. So yeah, conservatism. Uh, IQ. Uh, IQ figures are not reliable at a very early age in childhood, but, but later on, at a, at somewhere around age 20, 25, the IQ figures start to become very reliable predictors. Um, about half of the IQ scores at a person who is at age uh, 30 can be explained by uh, what genes they inherited. Alcoholism, religiosity. A few years ago, I don't think anybody would have guessed that the inclination to be religious could be influenced by genes. By genes? How, we don't know how these genes work. Uh, they, the genes that affect the structure of our brain and circuits, inf they influence how logical we are, how rational, how gullible, how much we tend to uh, 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 accept authority, etc. But, but clearly the research is, is pretty convincing to me that if you raise, if you raise, raise identical twins apart and they're raised in completely different environments, one in a highly religious uh, upbringing and the other one in, uh, in a totally non-religious, they tend to be the same. By the time they're adults, they're, 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 they score the same on, in, on uh, measures of religiosity. So genes do make a difference. Another approach to studying uh, behavior other than uh, biology behavior other than genes is to study the proximate causes. These, the, the proximate mechanisms are what the genes produce. Proximate uh, causes tell us what, where, when, how, who. Um, the proximate cause for, uh, say if we're wondering why some people have light skin, some people have dark skin. The proximate cause here is melanin. The amount of melanin that you happen to have in the skin. Uh, people with dark skin have more melanin, people with li have light skin have less melanin. Uh, menopause, what's the proximate explanation for menopause? Why do women stop? Uh, producing eggs at a certain around 50 years of age or so. Well, the proximate mechanism has to do with the pituitary st stop stimulating the ovaries to release eggs and so on. Long, there's a whole long chain of proximate effects. Um, how about falling in love? Is there? I hate to be unromantic, but but <laughs> there is a prox there are proximate mechanisms for falling in love. You, fall, you start falling in love first at usually in te early teenage years. The first crushes, the, the, the biological inclinations happen. And we, the, the, the scientists have identified what part of the brain is involved. The hypothalamus has a specific center for falling in love. 
Uh, surgeons have found that if you cut, if you have to cut through that part of the hypothalamus, the person afterwards can, they can still be friends, they can still have sex, but they totally lose that head, o they can't experience that head over heels uh, feeling of falling in love. Uh, so there's, there's circuitry for even that uh, romantic phenomenon. Uh, what are the proximate mechanisms for brain sex that make us male or female brains? Well, it's testosterone during the second month of prenatal development in humans that determines whether you, the brain, as I said, starts out female. If the brain receives sufficient testosterone during the second month of prenatal development, the brain will be converted into a male brain. And that person will show typical male behaviors as a child, will be interested in females as an adult. If the, if the, it doesn't matter what the, bio, what the anatomical sex of the person is. If the, uh, if a female fetus, otherwise physically a female, receives sufficient testosterone during that, that sensitive period, during the second month of her prenatal, she will show typical male behaviors pretty much as a child and will be interested in females later on. There are so many research studies that show this. Why everybody doesn't know this, I don't know. This, has been, this stuff has been known for 40 years. Why do we avoid uh, incest? Um, a, a colleague I know at, uh, at Wayne University uh, and, and several others have done research on this. There's an imprinting process during early childhood where we imprint on the smells of close relatives. Fathers especially and daughters imprint so that they find, it's just instinctive. They just don't find sex with that person later on to be something that they think they want to do. And by the way, the mechanism here for avoiding incest is the same as in other mammals. Whether it's ground squirrels or what, uh, all, virtually all animals have an imprinting process where usually by smell, they, they imprint on their, their close relatives when they're very young and then later they will not want to mate with them. And there have been all beautiful experiments done to prove this. You take a ground squirrel, uh, it take, put a stranger in his burrow with him, whom he's not related to, and he will become imprinted in such a way that he will, even if it's only for a week that he's with this other, other ground squirrel, he will not want to mate with her when he's an adult. On the other hand, if you take the, uh, uh, the sister, take his biological sister out of the burrow, and uh, remove her during this sensitive period for imprinting, he will later want to mate with her. It looks like the imprinting process that, the, the reason why we have incest to taboos in all cultures has a lot to do with biology. We get imprinted also by, biologically by the same way that ground squirrels do. Um, and there's so many more proximate mechanisms. Uh, why do we like certain shapes? Why do men usually like women with sour, uh, hourglass relative shapes? Why, do, why would men like breasts at all? Why do women like what we call masculine features in body shape and in uh, uh, face morphology and so on? All that has been studied. You know, behavioral biologists are studying all this stuff. We're finding lots and lots of interesting answers to this. For example, both sexes, for example, pick partners partly on the basis of good genes just like other animals do. What we find sexually attractive, what we find good looking, has a whole lot to do with our biology, uh, the, uh, our evolution. The third uh, approach to studying the biology behavior is to study the evolutionary reasons. And the evolutionary reasons, they don't tell us what, when, where, how, they tell us why. Why these behaviors came to exist rather than than some others, uh, with skin color, for example. Why did these people? Uh, why did genes in these uh, certain people pr uh, survive, become common, to produce dark skin? Well, it has to do with uh, dark skin evolved wherever people were closer to the equator. The darker skin helped to, helped to pr pr protect against vitamin D poisoning. It helped, uh, helped to protect against uh, skin cancer. But people who lived farther away from the equator tended, the genes for light skin tended to prevail there because these people were not getting sufficient vitamin D. And the skin cancer was not so much of a problem. Why menopause? 
I mean, we know the proximate mechanisms have to do with the ovaries and hormones and all, but why on earth would human females, why would menopause have evolved? Why? Uh, well, because it turns out there are several hypotheses about this, but, but per perhaps the best one is that females who happen to uh, become infertile at around age 50, uh, and when the chances of turning out another set of genes and being able to care for that offspring were pretty poor, those females who became infertile at that point and lived long enough to care for their children and their grandchildren ended up passing on more genes than women who, who stayed fertile. I know it seems, it seems contradictory to common sense, but, but genes for becoming infertile, by the way, genes for becoming infertile have happened in many animals. And we might predict, we can even predict where, where, we, where we would expect to find uh, uh, menopause. Elephants. Now, you, you have to have a species where the female lives long enough that her life overlaps that of her, her children and grandchildren. Then, then natural selection will favor menopause. There are many other cases where <laughs> genes for not even reproducing at all is the best way to pass on your genes, as with the social insects, where the workers don't, the worker bees don't mate at all. They are passing on their genes indirectly. Being sterile can be a way sometimes be, if you if you got evolutionary perspectives, if you understand that, that being serial can be the best way to pass on your genes. The evolutionary reasons are the ones that have been most neglected. I think most of us have an idea about the genes and the, and the proximate mechanisms, but the evolutionary perspectives are really, in this day, not understood hardly at all. Uh, Darwin gave us natural selection and provided the basis, but it wasn't until the 1960s that there, or an enormous revolution in evolutionary theory happened with Bill Hamilton. And have you heard of Hamilton? William D. Hamilton, um, English. He refined, he didn't contradict anything Darwin said. Darwin was basically right, but Darwin didn't know about genes. Darwin had no way of knowing anything about genes. Uh, so Darwin didn't, but Hamilton, in the 19, I think it was 1964, Hamilton refined evolutionary theory, natural selection theory, by focusing on the gene. Survival of the fittest in Darwin's day meant survival of the individual. It doesn't matter which individuals survive, really. It matters which genes survive. Individuals are survival machines for genes, from this perspective. And when Hamilton revolutionized our understanding of natural selection by making it gene focused in the 1960s. Oh my gosh, it just opened up a whole new world of explanation. All of a sudden things, all the things that Darwin couldn't understand. Why altruism? Why sterile caste? The things that Darwin was just embarrassed that he felt were contradictory to his theory. Hamilton straightened it all out. Hamilton showed that Darwin was not only right, but that uh, that by making uh, evolutionary theory, natural selection theory, gene focused instead of focusing on the individual, we could explain an awful lot of things that Darwin, if, Dar if I could pick two people to, to, to spend an evening together, I would bring back Hamilton and Darwin. They would just be out of their minds. Uh, Darwin would be so thrilled to meet Hamilton, knowing that all these problems that Darwin saw with evolutionary theory were now resolved because of Hamilton's insight about the importance of genes. Wow. Uh, and that's kind of why the revolution in understanding behavior really got underway more. Because, because evolutionary uh, theory, be evolutionary science became much more gene focused. Now it's a lot more possible to understand human behaviors than ever before. You know, Darwin's uh, discovery of evolution was just earth shaking. Was there ever uh, a, a discovery that you know, that we are all organisms, that we all evolved, that it's a natural process. Darwin made it, we didn't need religion anymore. Darwin showed us how to answer why questions. Before Darwin, about life. D uh, before Darwin, it was impossible to scienti give scientific answers to why questions about life. All these questions, none of them could be answered scientifically. Uh, I think Darwin's greatest contribution was not the discovery of evolution, but the, the realization of natural selection. 
That's, that showed us for the first time in all human history how to answer why. Why things are this way rather than that way. Why it's women who have menopause and not men. Why it's men who like these features, sexual features in women, and so on and so on and so on. These are some of the kinds of questions that came up in my class and that come up with behavioral biologists all the time. Uh, why are women so much more picky? Why, and it's true not just women. It's true of virtually all animals, from mosquitoes to, to alligators to people. The females are much more picky, much more choosy when it comes to mating. Why is it the Coolidge effect? Why is it men like sex with new partners so much? So much more than females do. Females you know, will switch partners for all sorts of different reasons, trading up better genes, better resources, and so on. But males are much more promiscuously inclined to change partners just because the partner is new. And they're, they're perfect, beautiful evolutionary explanations for why this is, this is true. Did you know humans have, except for our close relatives, the bonobos, who have the most, humans have more sex than any other species on Earth. Of the millions of species, humans have way more sex than any other species except bonobos. Why is this true? It sure is not just for procreation. The Catholic Church couldn't be, and a lot of churches couldn't be more wrong about this. The main purpose of sex is not in humans. It's certainly not procreation. Because of female choice, it's true that males are, who is it, Irvin DeVore, I think, said, uh, males are a breeding experiment run by females. Uh, males have largely been designed by females, and this is true of humans, too. If you don't like what you got, yeah, if females don't like male behaviors, male traits, and so on, blame your mothers and your grandmothers and your great-grandmothers all the way back because females made us males the way we are. You chose us. You chose what you liked back then. <laughs>